Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here, and I thank you for their heart and willing to learn. I thank you for their sacrifice of time, um, energy being here on a Saturday. Um, uh, and I praise you for the, for, the, for the faith you've authored in them. I thank you for, 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 the, for the hunger for your word that you, you've authored, authored in them. We pray for clarity of thought, um, for humility and all learning together. Uh, what you have for us today. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's get started. Um, chapter 10, verse yeah. 14. Now, we have a metaphor. Has it been two weeks? Just normal? Or has it been longer than that? Three. It's been two it feels weeks. longer than that for some reason. It does feel longer. I think I was, I was gone at a conference for, for a few days, and maybe that's why. When you go, go away, it feels funny. Okay, my computer always does this. Well, let me get started. Okay, and then on fire, the new people got the uh, printout. Do we still have some copies? Um, mm-hmm. Where's the extra copies? Go to the back. Okay. Well, let's get started. Uh, we, we always do a little review. We start at chapter 9. We're trying to answer the basic question. See, the underlying question of Romans 9 through 11 is why do the Jews reject Jesus as the Messiah? And you think, and I always remind everybody, that's a strange question to us. That's not a major apologetic question for us. Okay, two thousand years later, Christianity is sufficiently and so separated from the from Judaism that people, we actually have to argue backwards. Oh yeah, Jesus is Jewish. Oh really? Oh wow! Right? There's kind of a shock. Like, oh yeah, he's Jewish. So is Paul. And like all the disciples. It's a Jewish religion. What the heck? You know? Whereas there's a separation between the two that this is abs- and absolutely not an apologetic question for our day. But in the first century, it is the crucial question. For, for, for Christians, so as you're spreading the word about Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, okay, he's the Jewish Messiah, long prophesied by the prophets and by, by, by you know, the Torah, and, and this is the one who, did the, the eschatological final age king that's going to rule the world. Okay, great. Why don't the Jews believe him? That, that would be kind of a, yeah, you know, his own people doesn't believe him. That's a problem. So, a two underlying concerns. First, is God faithful to his covenant with Abraham? And second, how can Jesus be the Jewish Messiah if Jews, Jews don't, don't, don't accept him? So God made this deal with Abraham. I'm going to use your children to bless the world. Okay, the Jews are not part of this now. Is God faithful or has he just dumped them? Has he dumped his people and done something new and different? How different is Christianity from Judaism is really the question now. You know, what is there, that, that interrelationship? So 9 through 11 is really kind of tease out this relationship and, work, and working it out. Under, with, with teasing out for us, like, you know, rational mind, we want to know how it works. But on top of that is a tremendous important question, which is, what is the character of God? Okay, if you say, okay, this is a brand new thing, well then, is, was God faithful to Abraham? Did he just dump the promise? Is that gone now? Okay, so that, that's the question. And the second question is, well, if Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, I mean, the king, the Jewish king, how can he be the Jewish king? Right. So if, he, if, if the Jews don't accept him. So Paul begins to address the issue by asserting God's faithfulness. God is indeed faithful. His word has not, has not failed. Um, his word has not failed. He begins by offering the interpretive key to his highly selective history of Israel, for not all that are from Israel are Israel. So you have this beginning part. He starts telling the story of Israel okay, in a very strange way. You would never hear the story told this way. But it's all, it's, it's, it begins with Ishmael and Isaac, and God chooses Isaac of the promise. They say, okay, well, Ishmael was the, the son of Hagar, not the official wife anyway. Okay, well, the next generation, Isaac and Rebekah, they have twins. Twins, for goodness sake. And God says, you know what, I'm going to pick the younger one over the older one. And I'm just going to work out my, my, work out my, 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 um, my decision um, in, in this line of people. And the, and the question is, not all from Israel are Israel. That's the interpretive key. So people are being paired away. There's people who are, who are children of Abraham physically, but are not really. Okay. And so selection, separation, and the sovereignty of God's plan with Ishmael, Isaac, Isaac, Esau, Jacob. And the question people will immediately raise is, well, wait a minute. Is that fair? Is that, you know, what is going on? Can God really do that? And, and the answer is, um, well, look at the story of the golden calf. So he access texts that are out of, Deut- uh, out of Exodus. Um, and, and dealing with, um, and also dealing with Pharaoh. And, and it's really the same underlying argument, which is, I can do things with people if they're already rebellious. Okay? If they're rebellious people, then, you know, look, look at Pharaoh. Pharaoh's basically in char- on charge of a genocidal regime that kills children, kills babies, throws them into water and drowns them. That kind of cruelty, that kind of inhumanity, I can do what the hell I want to do with it. And there's no complaints. Nobody should be able to complain about that. I will harden his heart, I will make sure he does not repent, and I, I, will, I will make sure that he and his nation suffers the full extent 
of their evil for their evil and consequences. And nobody should complain because he's that bad already. Okay. So what we're dealing with, underlying storyline is, we're not dealing with tabula rasa, we're not dealing with blank slates in people. We have rebellious people and God says, you know what, with something like this, I can, I, I can do as I please. Which really takes you into the storyline of um, the clay, the pot and clay metaphor, which is really the same argument. Israel is clay. All right? And I know that typically clay, uh, uh, potter and clay metaphor emphasizes the sovereignty of the potter. But in the story we saw, in the, in, the, uh, in the Jeremiah passages, what we saw was, in Isaiah passages, what we saw was, wait a minute, it really isn't saying that potter can do whatever he wants. It's actually saying the clay is crap. The clay falls apart. The clay is like not working. It's a rebellious piece of material in which then the clay really loses any right to complain. And, and if you want to go back to the Old Testament and look for that, you go, well, that's actually the storyline of the Old Testament. If you think storyline, God, God chooses Abraham, sets him up, and then rebellion, 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 all the way through the story until you get to the end of Second Kings. It's a story of massive rebellion against God. Um, so they have, Israel has no right to complain. The material is unworthy. And God, what God's going to do is he's going to use his unworthy material to actually bring glory, oops, to bring glory to other vessels. Come back. Okay. You won't come back. That's very strange. Sorry? All right. <clears throat> Time for a new computer. Or something. All right, let, let me just, um, <coughs> let's just go forward then. Okay. Um, Romans 9.30. Um, as Paul steps out of the story of Israel, he knows the irony of the Gentiles have achieved the righteousness pursued by the Israelites. The Israelites have tripped over the stumbling stone, which is the Messiah. Jewish rejection of Jesus argues for his Messiahship. What do we mean by that? Okay, uh, so this is, so we leave Israel, we, we leave the story of Israel. What we have noted is um, Gentiles, the, the, okay, so let me, let me back up. Well, righteousness, what we meant is kind of the uh, being in the right relationship with God, the vindication, the situation being right with God. Okay, and Gentiles got this. The Israels were pursuing it, but they were pursuing it in an incorrect way. Okay. They read the Torah, and what they get out of it is, we are chosen and we're different from the Gentiles. We have some kind of a national superiority, national badge of honor. Actually, today you hear Jews mentioning that we're the chosen people of God. There's still that kind of understanding of who they are. And, that this, and Paul says, no, 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 you have finally missed the point. The Torah doesn't aim at racial, national distinction and privilege. It aims at blessing of the world. Okay. If you're orienting your life toward separating yourself from Gentiles in order to say, you know, I'm different, I'm, I'm blessed and you are not, then you have completely missed the point because the whole point is actually to, 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 to spread the blessing to, to the rest of the world. Um, and, that's, and that's my point too. They, they pursue a program of ethnic distinction for their own advantage and they see in the Torah a collection of rules that can distinguish them from the Gentile so as to elevate them to a special status. And I, cannot, I bring this up over and over again. When you read the Torah, when you read the five books of, of, of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, what do you get out of it? When you read it all the way through, what's the message? Okay. The Jews said, well, there's a bunch of rules in there, and we're chosen of Abraham, therefore. Right? Therefore, this is about us being special and, and, and having land eventually and, and, and all that. And Paul says, no, 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 if you read it right, it's actually about eventually opening the floodgates to all, to all Gentiles, bringing everybody in. Yes. Sorry, I have a question. Sure. Uh, the Jews, aren't, as we understand them today, aren't, are they not specifically the descendants of the tribe of, Ju of Judah and the Ten Tribes? Uh, that's a good question. So, right. Uh, the, the, the tribes, the, the northern tribes were lost by 722 and then we never really found them ever again. And what Paul has done in Romans is really saying that really represents the nations. Today the Jewish people are supposedly connected to the, lower, to the, to the southern tribe, the Judah. Yeah. So today, but you know, there's been so many generations of intermarriages. And it's really hard to tell if there's actually a, you know, ethnicity is hard. I think Ju Ju the Jewish tradition now is very, I don't think it's, it's bound by ethnicity, it's, uh, by bloodlines as much as bound by tradition. And, and, and kind of a, 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 and it's not even that religious. I mean, I, I know that I, m many, m I, mean, I don't know, I mean. Depends on where. It depends on where. I mean, if you're Orthodox Jew, yes. But I would say in America, 80% of Jews are not religious. And that's the number that's tossed up by a Jewish group that, 
Like they're just not, I mean, and most Jewish friends I know are not very religious. They'd rather not talk. Being religious gets them in trouble. So they don't like religion. But you have the mess <coughs> messianic. You do have those. So I grew you, up with some of them. Okay. So they do exist. So yeah, you can, so I do not generalize. There's a widespread, you have atheist Jews, right? You do have those. So it's like, really? Okay. You have atheist Jews and you have, and, you know, and then you have the Orthodox Jews and, and you have the reform, you have, you have conservative, you have this whole range of behavior, um, a whole range, a whole range of possibilities. So, um, okay. But, but um, since we're on that topic, uh, let's not, let's also be careful that to not to mistake this contemporary Jewish world, modern, modern Judaism, with uh, first century Jews. Okay, massive changes happened from, he from here to present. Um, most, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing is 70 AD and the destruction of the temple. And the second biggest thing is 135, the, uh, the Bar Kokhba revolution, in which the Jews were kicked out of Palestine. Okay, so from those two events, Judaism has to change. Okay. At the time of Paul, Judaism was per they were pursuing a program of not ethnic distinction for the purpose of the recovery of the kingdom of God. Okay, the Davidic line, reestablish king, kick out the Romans, bring a new Messiah, build Israel all over again. That was the driving program. Okay, for, for the Pharisees, yes, for the Zealots, yes. Maybe not so much for the, uh, for the Sadducees, they didn't care that much. But for, for large segments of the people, population, we are waiting for the God, for God to come and give us our land and, 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 our, and, and make this, cleanse this temple and make it right. And, by, and, when, and when you get to the second century when that didn't happen, the temple's gone. How do you do sacrifices? Right? How, do you, how do you have a, we don't have a land anymore, we're not even there, we don't even live in Jerusalem anymore. So there's, there's massive changes in Judaism in, in, in the form of Talmud and Mishnah that turned uh, Yahweh worship from focus on temple and sacrifice and kingship toward Torah study. So that Judaism became more of a Torah driven text or oriented religion um, since uh, from the basically end of first century, second century onward. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so today's Judaism is going to be very different. Right. And then the modern Israel is a very fairly recent phenomenon that's really, it was founded not out of any religious um, motivation at all. I mean, modern Zionism was not a, not a, not a heavily religious based. Um, in fact, most of the really religious Jews opposed at the founding of Israel. It was a communist project. It was a, it was a, project. It was a socialist, a secular project, and it was not at all. Um, and and, mo and, and, and most, many of the conservative Jews um, thought, you know, you should wait for the Messiah to do this. This isn't it. And, 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 uh, but now they're embracing the project, so things are changing. Things are always changing. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we just went off a little bit, sorry. Okay, um, let's keep going. The trajectory of the Torah is about ethnic distinction, but the Messiah, which leads to the Messianic kingship over the earth, oh wait, it's not, sorry. It's not about ethnic distinction. Wow, that's really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's ugly. All right, not about ethnic distinction, but the Messiah, which leads to the Messianic kingship over all the earth, over both Jew Gentiles and Jews. So this is, so he's talking about the, the Torah itself. And he said, remember we had this big discussion about the end of the Torah. Okay, tell us, is it purpose or is it the cessation? Is Torah finished? The, 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 is the Messiah leads to the Torah being finished? There's one reading. You know, and we thought, that can't be. He's talking about fulfillment of the Torah. He's talking about the importance of the Torah. No, he's getting at is the purpose of the Torah. Okay, that the Torah is going to lead us straight to the Messiah if you read it properly. Okay, it's about blessing of the nations, about kings, like the coming of the king. And then... I'm sorry, so these are your notes, right? That, that should be three? Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm having problems. I'm sorry, and then you said there are the... There's two types of the world, people, there's three types of people in the world who can count and those who can't. So, all right. <laughs> Go on. And you said that there, is there a knot there that's not supposed to not Yeah, there's a knot there, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I pointed that out already. I know, but I, I wasn't following. Oh, sorry, let's try that again. That was my fault. Number, first of all, it's number three. <laughs> However, the trajectory of Torah... I was looking at two, not three. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, like this doesn't sound like Monty Python. <laughs> One, two, five. You know, like, whoa. <laughs> this, is just getting, this is just getting ugly. <laughs> One, two, two, what? Okay. Me, sir. Maybe I'm just so used to thinking in binary terms. Okay, no. Um, the computer science coming back. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Except you, it, it, two it, you wouldn't get two. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't get two. That's the problem. It's just one, one. Two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I figured somebody put that up. <laughs> Non-linear counting. Okay. Base uh, three is just Trinitarian, so you know you're fine. Oh, thanks. I appreciate yeah, that. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these two are combined in the roads. <laughs> okay. 
So, let's keep let's finishing this up. There's four. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay. So Paul proves at the end of the Torah to tell us the the purpose, the the goal of the Torah is the Messiah by arguing from Deuteronomy 30, which is actually from the literal end of the Torah, which is a very cool thing to do. Uh, the Messiah is the one that enables the life of the last age. So you see the end of the Torah actually talks about there's a time to return from exile in which you will be you will have a circumcision of the heart. This is right in the Torah. Okay. The transformation of human life, the transformation of the of the people so that they will be able to relate to God very easily instead of with great difficulty. The word will be near you. Okay. You'd be like, you want to go get it, because it'll be right there. And Paul says, Well, yeah, it's right there because Jesus got it for you. So he pulled, puts Messiah, Messiah, he puts Jesus, the Messiah, straight snap dab in the in the end, right in the end of Deuteronomy, saying that passage is really about Jesus. Okay. So that takes us to today's passage. Okay. So uh, let me let me just go back to make sure we, we get the flow right, and we'll come back here. Okay? This is from last time. Um, so for Moses, this is from last time. For Moses, right of the from the Torah righteousness that the man who does these things will live by them. But from the from the from faith righteousness says this: Do not say in your heart who will ascend in the heavens. This is out of Deuteronomy 30. This is the this is my Messiah coming down. Okay, remember we talked about this crazy passage, which is just seemingly impossible to read. Okay, but quoting quoting Deuteronomy, they they are um, they're talking about the transformation of humanity and the word of God being near. And he's, and, and Moses is saying, don't say who will ascend to heaven. It's too far, right? And Paul says, no, no, that's Messiah. He already got it for you. He brought it down for you. Who will go into the abyss? That's the Messiah rising from the dead. Okay. It's, it's, it, that's why. But what does, what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. This is the word of faith that we're proclaiming. Right? We, we have a transformed humanity in which God's word is no longer far away. It's, not, it's easy. You can do this command now because you're, you've been circumcised in the heart. And that's in Deuteronomy 30. So, and, and this is the word of faith we're proclaiming. What is that word? That if you, so he's, he's actually plugging this confession right back into Moses in Deuteronomy 30. He said, the word that is near you, what is that word? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? And we talked about the, the significance of this verse, that it isn't just some kind of a faith accent or some kind of verbal saying the words. What we talked about very clearly was to confess, confess Jesus as Lord is a political act of allegiance, which gets you killed in the Roman Empire. And to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and to believe in the resurrection, is to believe that Jesus is the eschatological king. He is the final king of the universe, the final age. So these two are content as well as action. And, it, and, 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 and these two things, believing Jesus is the eschatological king, and then declaring him as the one you will obey, swear allegiance to him, that means you are now part of the kingdom. Okay. Which, for many... Um, no, let's move on there. Okay. So, by, for by the heart one believes unto righteousness, and by the mouth one confesses into salvation. For Scripture says, everyone who believes in him will never be shamed. For there's no distinction between Jew and Jew Greeks. For the same Lord is over all, being rich toward all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we, we ended with that last time. Okay. So, that transitions right into this pa today's passage. How then could they call on him who they have not believed? <coughs> And how could they believe in whom they have not heard? And how could they hear without someone preaching? And how could they preach if they're not sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the gospel of the good things. But not all have obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So the faith is from hearing, and the hearing is to the word of the Messiah. But I ask, have they not heard? Of course they have. Into all the earth their voice has gone out, and into the ends of the world their words. But I ask, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will make you jealous regarding to what is not a nation. With a senseless nation, I will make you angry. And Isaiah is bold and says, I was found by those who were not seeking me. I became manifest to those who were not asking me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I stretch out my hands to a people disobedient and argumentative. Okay, how many Old Testament references are there in this passage? <laughs> just, this is nonstop, okay? And when they do that, it's just, it's just, we just have to slow it down and break it down. It's really, it's really not an easy passage. Uh, let's look at verse 14 and 15 to get started. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay, remember, uh, there's no distinction between Jews and Greeks. Jews see scripture and see this ethnic distinction in the first century. Paul says, no, scripture says everyone who believes in him will never be ashamed. Everyone. 
No distinction. There's no distinction between Jews and Greeks. The same Lord is overall, right? So then, verse 14, how then could they call on him on whom they had not believed? So, what he's really getting at, if you look at the, what, what verse 11 on 13 says, is that the Torah really leads to worldwide Gentile mission. Right? It is part and parcel of the Jewish faith that we eventually preach the lordship of the final king to the whole world. That's, that's trajectory is built in the Torah itself. Um, and if you don't read that correctly, as the Jews did not, then it leads to all kinds of problems. Now, once you do that, when, now here's what's interesting, verse 14 he gets excited. I mean, he's getting excited about Gentile mission, and let's not forget why he wrote the letter. Do you guys remember why he wrote the letter? I, I, we, this is, we discussed this in Romans 1 through 8. This is like last year. When we did, when we did Romans 1 through 8. Remember the, 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 the specific occasion for the letter is that Paul is... Raising mm-hmm. support for a mission to Spain? Mission to Spain, right. So let's not forget that part, okay? So, so he's saying, look, the, the scripture is leading you straight to Gentile mission, and how could they call on him whom they have not believed? Right? And how could they believe in whom they have not heard? And how could they hear without someone preaching? And how could they preach if they were not sent? Who's he talking about? Hey, I'm good. But, but remember, remember the, the, the problem with the, the, this 9 through 11, right? Paul's dealing with a Paul's dealing with a problem that he is perceived as a Gentile person, Gentile preaching oriented um, a, a, a leader, a preacher. Right? So he's always trying to walk that walk. Saying, you know, I, I do care about the Jews. I want, I, I, you know, I swear I, I, I could die for them. I wish I could be accursed for them. It happens just early in chapter 9. He's dis- describing how much he loves his people. Okay. So what he's done here is he's rooted his mission, his Gentile mission to Spain, smack dab in the story of the Torah. I love my people. I love my tradition so much. I'm going to Spain to preach the Gentiles. Does that make sense? Right? You see what he's done. It's like, whoa, this whole thing is really, is so grounded in the Torah that if I didn't, I wouldn't be really faithful to the Torah. I am being faithful. I'm being Jewish to the, to the max here. Okay? So being Jewish to the core leads you to Gentile men. <coughs> okay. So that's what he's done here. So, yeah, and also, it, 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 definitely, it definitely helps to, 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 to have a little thing, you know, you know People need to get. People need to get. People need to hear, and they need, they need to get sent. Okay. So this is he. Him going to Spain is actually the fulfillment of the Torah. Any questions on this passage? We we like this passage. This is about mission, and we preach this a lot. Um, but what we usually miss is how much this passage is grounded, which is the whole point. It's grounding Gentile mission as the culmination of the story of Israel, the story of the Torah. This is a Jewish act. Okay. That, that's his point. But it definitely serves to to send us to our mission. Okay, uh, so he's doing he's quoting Isaiah 52 here. Uh, How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the gospel of, of the good things? Um, Isaiah 52, uh, verse seven. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings? Um, I think we for those of you who heard my gospel talk, you'll know that, uh, or more than once uh, when I do the IV grad, um, brings good tidings. Yuangelitsomai. Uh, Yongelion uh, means gospel. That's the word for gospel. Greek, um, the, the Greek word for gospel is right here. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of those who brings the gospel, who evangelize, who publishes peace, who brings good tidings. And once again, who evangelize or brings good news of good, publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Okay. Our heart, your watchmen, lift up their voice together, they sing for joy. For eye to eye, they see the return of, the, of Yahweh to Zion. Break forth together into singing, your waste place of Jerusalem. For Yahweh has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. Yahweh has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Okay, so this passage, Isaiah 52, is out of the second Isaiah. Uh, the section is written to the exiles. So remember your Israelite history. Um, 586 BC, Judah was finally dest- uh, finally uh, destroyed by Babylon. Um, the king, his children were murdered in front of him, executed in front of him, and he has eyes got- eyes gouged out, and he was taken to Babylon along with the rest of the upper most of the people of Israel. They left some poor people behind to kind of farm the place. Uh, temple was destroyed. All the major buildings were destroyed. This is this the massive sacking of Jerusalem. The Babylonian ship, other people in there. Uh, no, that's that. You're thinking about the Assyrians and what right. they did with a northern kingdom. Okay. So the Assyrians did. Assyrians um, had the policy of mixing people up. 
Because the you take people out of a place, put it somewhere else, and bring other people in. They're just massive people transfer transfer because they figure that will lead to a minimum disruption. Uh, people will not re people are not likely to rebel when their social networks are destroyed. So if you're not connected to a land, you're not connected to your religion, you just have a tendency to, to kind of become bland Assyrian people. Babylonian um, uh, policy was actually to strip the elites and take it to Babylon for you to work for them. So people like Daniel, of course, is the primary example you'll see. It's like you can read, you can write, you're smart, you're artisan, you have, you're crafty, you're engineer, you're a masonry people, off you go to Babylon. And they leave, they tend to leave the lower population behind because we need farmers. So leave them there to work the land. So and then they'll impose some kind of a local lead, a local work, um, um, well, you know, somebody, somebody, there'll be somebody in charge. Yeah, there'll be somebody in charge. And that's how the, uh, for them, for example, the Jeremiah story ends because they left somebody in charge and, and the Israelites murdered him and then they have to run off to Egypt. So that's another part of the story there. Um, okay. So in this part of Isaiah, it's addressed to the exiles. Okay. And the exile has different problems than we, we, we don't tend to think about the exiles having this kind of problem because we rarely put ourselves in, in their shoes. Multiple questions. What happened to the covenant? Okay. Are we still God's people? Did Yahweh lose to Marduk? Okay, like, what? Yeah, those are the questions they, they have. Yahweh lost. Marduk's a Babylonian, Marduk's a Babylonian deity. Marduk kicked our God's butt. Okay, War, military warfare was 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 a, a, a divine warfare by proxy. Okay, you okay, you have your people, they have their people, and they fight, and whoever wins, their God won. So if you lose to Marduk, you lost. Your king, your God's no good. And what happens in the ancient world is you have these dead gods strewn all across the ancient world. Once they lose a battle, their temple gets wiped out. Nobody worships them anymore. Well, usually what happens is uh, the, the conquering uh, nation will take their uh, king's, their god's idol and move them to the, their own temple and leave them there. So he becomes kind of a slower god in their pantheon. So you got to incorporate it. Okay. Interesting move. Okay. But who's going to worship the lower god? You know, the one who can't be martyred. Why? I want to worship that god for what reason? Right. So gods die in the ancient world. Okay. So is Yahweh dead if he can't defend his own temple? Okay. So these are the kind of basic questions that strike people. And you have people, you know, you have prophets that come along and speak to them, says, no, and Jeremiah, Ezekiel being prominent upon them during the exile that says, look, you did this not because God can't, is too weak, but because you disobey the covenant. This is actually God attacking you. God has waged war against you. Okay, in a sense, committing suicide. Okay. So what happened in this passage then is He's trying to rouse the people. You know, comfort, comfort my people. You, you paid enough. Okay, it's time to go back. I will send. I will. I will send you back to Jerusalem. I will reestablish the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Israel. So, so fifty-two seven is kind of a visualization of this per, this herald. Okay. So how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaiming the gospel, the gospel of the good news of what? To 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 first of all to Zion. He's proclaiming it to Jerusalem. So we're in Babylon, we're speaking in Babylon, we're going to send a herald all the way to Jerusalem, say, hey, your God is reigning, or your God is starting to reign. He is going to take, become king now. Okay? And then Jerusalem's watchman is going to, is going to lift up their voice, because they see the herald, and they're going to sing. So, they, so we have this vision of this herald coming on the mountain, climbing the mountain of Zion, and the watchman coming up on the, on the walls of Jerusalem. There's no walls, probably. Uh, but, and, they're, and they're kind of yelling back and forth and singing back and forth, right? So he says, your God reigns. And they'll say, you know, they're going to sing for joy. I do, I they see the return of the Lord to Zion. They're going to see with their own eyes. Break forth together in the singing, you waste on Jerusalem. God has comforted us to be ways redeemed Jerusalem. He is going to bear his our holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. So you see this, the, the next line I didn't put in here is that he's going to lead this parade of people out of Babylon. He's going to be in front, he's going to be your rear guard. It's going to be this guarded uh, 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 exodus, out, exodus out of Babylon straight back. And this is kind of the main theme of, the, of mostly, most of the second Isaiah. Right? You, you, you know this section from, from uh, the Messiah. Uh, it, it, it handles Messiah. You know, every valley would be made low, and that's how it doesn't make sense. Every mountain would be made low, and a valley would be raised, right? It's, it's like, yeah, we'd be made low. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. What is it going on? It's flattening the lands, right? Mountains flattened, valley raised up, crooked place made straight, wide. We're filling it all in to make this super highway 
for the return of the exile back to, Israel, back to Israel. So this whole story then, this whole focus about gospel and the good news is about the restart of the kingdom of God and the end of exile. Okay. So what does Paul do with this passage? Well, first of all, you notice he, he dropped a couple, he dropped the word. Uh, How beautiful upon the mountains of the feet of him who brings good news. He dropped the mountains. Maybe he doesn't think Israel, I mean, Spain has mountains, I don't know. But the mountains reference to Mount Zion, right? So he's climbing up the, it's not really a mountain, it's not really not that high, okay? They have, they're kind of, they have an exaggerated sense of how tall Mount Zion is, all the mountains. But they climb up, they climb in the mountains, they have beautiful the mountains, okay? Um, um, wait, did you guys know that song, Our God Reigns? How beautiful, how, how lovely are the mountains, mm-hmm. on the mountains of the feet of those who brings the good news. Mm-hmm. We used to sing the song in college, and then we like, I, I would ask the students, what's beautiful? And most of them say, mountains. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> okay. And so I, think, I can see why Paul dumped it, because no, the mountains are not beautiful. It's the feet of those who bring good news. It's the, the feet of the herald are beautiful. Okay. But anyway, just to make this point. That, not, not to belabor, but I also heard in college that, that if they won a battle, they would put uh, shiny, shiny material on their, on their shoes so that uh, when they came in to announce the good news huh. that they had. That that's what that's a reference to. Interesting. I did not. I have not heard that. It seems credible. I have not heard that. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. A lot of these things. Like, yeah. It's a lot of these are somewhat apocryphal. They're like that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea. At least that makes sense, though, right? That this is a victorious person would have it, so you can see it from far away. At least makes sense. Yeah. Right? Whether it's apocryphal or. Well, why would you put it on that? your feet? Why don't you just carry it on everyone? Because you're running. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I, I I don't know that. One. Sorry. Okay. That's um, fine. So here what Paul does is he takes this passage and he references it to Gentile mission. Right? That's what he's done with it. He's saying, he's really, he's saying, look, this return from exile is really in some sense um, the story of Gentile mission. Um, how, how can we do this? Um, first of all, we, we, we already got the storyline. Not everyone from Israel is Israel. Okay. In chapter four, in chapter four, Romans, he made it very clear that everyone who has faith in who has who has faith is a child of Abraham. So, so Gentile mission is a proclamation to Israel in the broader sense, because Israel is now opened up. Okay, you, you know what I'm saying? Israel is no longer narrowly focused on a few people. Everyone who has faith in Abraham is Israel. Not all people born of Abraham are actually Israel. So Israel concept is now expanding. So therefore you can take a passage that is really about the return from exile, the proclamation of the gospel, of, of the coming reign of God. And he says, look, we just expand. This is really about Gentile mission. Okay. And then we have verse 10. The Lord has bared his arm before the eyes of all nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Okay. The salvation of the world was built into this. To the, to, to, to the second to the second Isaiah section. Does that make sense what he did here? What he does here? Okay. He, he, he kind of he just it makes that is Israel concept elastic, which is he's been doing that for quite a while. And now that we have a passage about proclaiming the good news to Israel about the return to Zion, he's saying, no, 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 it's really about coming to the kingdom of God and he's going to proclaim it to Spain. Or wherever you want to go. Okay. But not all have obeyed the gospel. For, I, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Okay. Um, so you have call, believe, hearing, preaching, but not all obey. Um, here's an interesting question. I don't know if you noticed, this is from Isaiah 53. So he's actually going, he's moving through Isaiah again. He's moving through Isaiah 52 to Isaiah 53. This is 53.1. If you look up your, your text, you can actually see that. If you follow Isaiah, it'd be like 52, he's, he's quoting it, and then boom, 50 to 53. Whoa. Not for not who has believed our message. Okay. So, and this takes you right into the suffering servant servant passage. Okay, you guys are familiar with, with, with what he's doing with Isaiah here? Uh, this is the fourth servant song, um, which confirms I think his vocation. He's proclaiming Messiah in Isaiah fifty three to the whole world. He he has that role. Okay. So call, believe, hearing, preaching, and not all obey, and we all know that. Okay, not all obey. Um, Faith is from the message, and the message is through the word of the Messiah. Okay. 
Um, the word refers back to um, verse 8. Remember talking about the word is near you? Right? The, when the word has come. It's, it's not literally a word, but it's really just, it, it's, um, it's not words about Messiah. But it's, I, I, don't, I don't think, I, th I, think, I think he's talking about um, the word of the Messiah being um, embodied um, that has to be has to be brought up from brought sorry brought down from heaven or brought from the abyss. Okay, he's talking about that word. So read it in the context of that. The word is near you, which I think he's talking about transformation, right? Because it's it's the nearness of the word that allows you to live out the life. Does that make sense? This is this is kind of hard. He's being very brief here. You notice faith is in the message and the message from the word of the Messiah. Okay. Um, and if, if 17 is kind of vague, verse 18 is even worse. Um, verse 18 just gets flat out, becomes incomprehensible here. Um, we have a couple options. But I ask, have they not heard? Of course they have. Into all the earth their voice has gone out, and into the ends of the world their words. Okay. It's difficult here. Um, it's quoting out of verse 19, right? Uh, Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the story of God, and the firmament proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are, the, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out throughout all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them He has set a tent for the sun, blah, 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 blah. So He's quoting out of verse 4, right? So let's, let's go back there real quick. Um, wait, no, wrong way. So He's quoting Psalm 19 here. And. If you go with the context of Psalm 19, he's talking about creation. He's saying, even though I haven't preached, the words have gone out in the, in the form of creation. Mm. Right? Which goes, harkening back to Psalm 1, in the Romans 1, what he says, you know, God's eternal quality is, is it's just not obvious to everyone. And so they have no excuse. He, it, he has some kind of natural theology idea at play here. That the, there is a basic message that God has sent to the world. Um, but the location of this passage is problematic because he should have put it in front of this section and be saying like, okay, they have that, but they need more. They need, there needs to be some kind of contrast between we need people to preach because they haven't heard. If they, how are they going to believe they haven't heard? You know, blah, 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 blah. That whole section we saw earlier. And then he ends it with this. This is like, this is kind of like a rhetorical downer. He, he just invalidated his own case. He's been saying, you need to give me money, send me to Spain. Oh, by the way, they've already heard. <laughs> that's the problem with this, with this line. You see that? You see the logic that's like, wait a minute, if a good rhetorician would have done that, I would say, yeah, they have heard, yes, but what they need to hear is more. They need to hear that Christ himself, right? If, they're, if, if he's saying here somehow that this hearing is actually proclaiming the word of the Messiah, then he's saying that nature itself and creation itself can actually give, give people knowledge of the Messiah. You see the problem with this passage. This is a very strange passage here, and it leads to a, you know, we have so I, there's you know there's that creation understanding. Uh, there's other people doing different things here, but I just want to point out the difficulty with this. Um, I know a lot of people. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just, just that, uh, um, have they not heard? They represent. Um uh, the, the people, right? Because he's been talking about like everyone. No. Well, he's he's been talking about. Um, He's talking about worldwide Gentile mission, right? Because you notice, every, not, okay, no distinction between Jews and Greeks, where they same Lord is overall, right? So for everyone, who, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, how can then could they call on him whom they have not believed? Okay, they haven't believed in him. How could they believe in him when they have not heard? So he's talking about everyone who hasn't heard of Jesus. You can do Jews, you can do Gentiles, you can do anybody you want. But people who haven't heard of Jesus, and how can they hear without someone preaching? So he's doing this, we need preachers so that people can hear and they can, they can then call, they can believe and then they can call upon him, right? And then, oh yeah, by the way, I need to be sent. That's kind of the payoff, right? It's like the final, the final rhetorical question, the final rhetorical question, somebody needs to be sent to people. And we know that in Galatians, um, Paul viewed this as Paul was sent to the, to the, to the Gentiles and, and Peter was sent to the Jews. He has this idea of being, of being apostles, which, of course, is the word for sent. Uh, you know, apostle also is sent ones. So they're being sent. Okay. And then, so you see where, where we're going. So the question you're asking, so we're going with this is, all of a sudden, he says, well, they not all have to obey the gospel because they haven't believed it. But then I ask, well, have they not heard? Of course they have. 
So he seems to have undercut his own argument, and, and we don't like that. We don't. We think Paul's rhetorically brilliant, so we must be reading something wrong. <laughs> okay, that's when you, when, you, when, you, when Paul's not being logical, we're usually at fault. <laughs> okay, just kind of you're like we did something wrong. That's just kind of a basic thesis I always do. Uh, biblical. A lot of people go with biblical scholars. Just, I mean, they would go with biblical authors being you know um, contradictory. Or something, and I, or they're not—they're they're not, they're miscommunicating. And I'm, I'm like, I thought, you know, that's just a very strange way to, to to interpret the Bible. I would never go that way, given that this is a text written 2,000 years ago. Chances are, I'm blowing something. Uh, okay, I, I just must be. So I have problem with this passage, not because of Paul, but I think I'm miss—I'm missing something. Now, so is, what's interesting here is that. So Wright proposes um, this argument. So I, I did the traditional. This is some kind of some kind of, um, uh, some kind of a creation-driven message. Uh, Wright argues uh, this one. He he says, well, if you keep going with this psalm, it actually starts talking about the Torah. Look at verse seven. If he keeps going, he has he talks about the nature and the sun and coming down, all, kind of, all that kind of stuff. But then he talks about the Torah, the law is of Yahweh is perfect, reviving the soul, and, and so on and so forth. He's just talking about the importance of Torah. So a lot of people hold this this, this psalm as kind of the if you want to get systematic theology here, natural theology versus revealed theology, right? You have theology of what can be known about God through creation and what can be known about God through special revelation. And this psalm really kind of holds the two together. It's like you celebrate both. There's word this way, and then there's word from God. There's word from creation and word from God. Okay, so Bible of the world versus Bible of Scripture. Um, so Wright says he has the idea that somehow um, what he's saying is the tor- he, He's saying that this new thing that he's proclaiming is um, really talking about the Torah, and the Torah has now gone out. So he's he's changing Psalm 19. Wright is argued that Paul is reading Psalm 19. But but not reading it, reading, referring to this as creation, but referring to it as Torah, mm-hmm. and now the Torah is on its way out. Um, but how, but have they heard? Mm-hmm. It doesn't to me it doesn't resolve the problem. It's like it's, that doesn't it doesn't make much sense. If yeah. if um, if Paul is just using this part and saying yes, the, the the witness of creation has gone out, but the psalm is saying these two must be held in tension. Yeah. Then then. Couldn't this citation be exactly what we were de- describing that he should have said by yeah. putting this? By had it, had he put this cite I see quote said. before? Right. So had he put the quote before, he would have been saying okay, everybody has this kind of general glimpse of God by right. by by his creation, but we still need to send people. Here he's here he could then be saying uh, we people have to be sent. Right. And yeah, you've you've heard this, but but remember remember the rest as well. Right. You still need the Torah okay. part okay. part of that. Okay. So of course they uh, of you know, course they've heard. And there's the implied, but we but more is needed. I I I, I, I like your approach. I like basically once again, and and this is where once again Paul he's not citing that verse. He's citing the whole psalm. And for, right? Is it is it weird to cite a psalm by a verse? By not the first verse. Um, that's a good question. So, so, so Paul's usage of the Old Testament has is, is, is been under study. It's one of the major studies in the past 20 years. You see books on this all over the place, just nonstop Pauline New Testament usage of the Old Testament, Pauline usage of the New Testament. And you see studies on this again and again. And there's different theories on this, and people disagree massively. I'm of the mind, along with Wright and others, that that Paul, when he uses this passage, he never quotes him out of context. He's usually bringing the whole context, whole consciousness into the story. And that's what, how I've been reading here, as you notice. I never just say, here's one verse. It's like, no, 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 what was the background? Um, and here, maybe I'm being too, maybe too reactive. I'm, I'm reading that verse in line of that few verses up there. And what you're saying is, no, 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 this actually references Psalm 19. The whole thing. And the whole message holds the two revel- ways of revelation in tension. So that in this passage, then he's saying, "Well, of course, have they not heard? Well, of course they have." But the whole, but then, yes, true, the creation speaks. But remember how the psalm ends: we need the Torah, which we need some kind of direct reveal proclamation, which I am now uniquely suited mm-hmm. to go out and proclaim. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so if you read it that way, now, now this is 
Like I said, this is difficult. Hard, it's hard to prove what you just said, even though I like you quite well. Okay, I can. That would make sense of this passage. The Psalm 19 is bringing Psalm 19 over is actually a way of saying, yeah, they've heard by creation, but they need the revealed side. They need the Torah, which in Psalm 19 talks about Torah, but we know what the Torah is referring to. We know the Torah is referring to the to the Messiah. So, I mean, in, in just the last chapter, Paul yeah. was was responding kind of preemptively to to arguments that he figured would cut, come back as a response. So if he's yeah. trying to trying to you know raise support for for a, a mission to Spain, yeah. he could anticipate the do we really have to go to Spain? I mean, right. They have they not already heard? So he's saying, well, yeah. of course they've heard, but. Interesting. Well, you still need to send me. Yeah, so yeah. did that in just the last chapter. Interesting. So, so this this passage is not a proof text mm -hmm. for they have already heard. It's actually a rebuttal against it. <laughs> oh boy. Let me. Th I'll have to think about that. Let me. Let me. Well, let me one thing that this doesn't prove anything. That but one thing that doesn't it make sense though that if we we always talk about in the ancient writing. That, that it was a, it took time to write like we didn't have these word processors. Okay. And so it seems like it would be unusual if he's wanting to bring in the whole passage. It would seem like it would be unusual for him to write out mm -hmm. 19 verses. Right. It, it is consistent with the technology of the time to to cite one verse as, as the context. Right. Rather than writing the whole thing out. The the, the difficulty with this reading is that the passage he cited seems to actually confirm the, ref the, the, the objection. You see what I'm saying? That's, to me, that, to me that's, that's why it's difficult. Um, which is why it's hard to, hard to, I mean, I like it, but it's hard to corroborate this reading because he, he could have picked almost any verse, but he picked the one that states what well, they've already heard because it went out. <coughs> So he picked so that why, very so one. Example, why didn't he pick a later verse in 19? Yeah, that would have been nice, huh? Like, there's so much like, talking about the God Torah. The yeah, Torah. something like that. Yeah. Anyway, Rick. But w w what comes next? Does what, does what yeah. comes next complete the argument? So is he saying in, and I'm just speculating, is, is, what, is what he's saying in Romans 18, uh, Romans 10, 18, but I ask before you do, you know, so he's going to state their case. I ask before you do, yeah. uh, have they not heard? Indeed they have. I agree with that point. Now right. let me... Uh, yeah. but, but Israel had heard too, right? Oh, in the you, you mean verse 19? Yeah. But I asked the Israel not know? Right. Okay, so, so, so my reading has... I have not followed that line. My reading, has, uh, uh, to a certain extent, takes us slightly backwards out of the Gentile mission discussion and moves us into the question of the Israel not know about the Torah being really oriented toward the Messiah. Okay. So, so, because you notice the answer he gives is all about, Israel seems, un, seems un, Israel seems to miss the point in their reading of the Torah. And so, and so for, for this then, so Israel needs something further right. to, yeah. help to help reveal to them what the Torah is, is really, really about. So yeah. Israel also has this certain certain body of work that they're working from, but they're not getting it right, and so they need something more. Couldn't it be the same thing with the Gentiles? The yes. Gentiles have this certain body of witness, mm -hmm. but they're right. not getting it right, so they need something more. Hmm. Okay. So in 18, he says, I, I think I think that's a possible reading. I, like I said, I, I think it's possible, right. with, I, and we need to. I think it, I think it, you you we provided a reading that makes it logical. I definitely agree with that. And that, I, I always like that. <laughs> That's always a very good thing. <laughs> when it says in verse 16, yep. but not all have obeyed the gospel, what is it talking about but the gospel? What do you see when it says that? Okay, so we're talking about the, pro the, pro the proclamation of, okay, remember the gospel takes straight you right back to Isaiah, right? So in Isaiah, he's talking about uh, the, the herald comes and proclaims the gospel. He's using that euangelion, euangelizo word, right? So we have proclaimed the good tiding. Now, um, not all have obeyed. In the Isaiah story, would be not all Jews have 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 obeyed the proclamation. But Paul is talking about this mission to the, to the world. So all would be, I think, Jews and Gentiles who have not um, obeyed Jesus as the King. Okay, so it's it, the gospel music. Uh, it it refers to Jesus Christ and obey, right? Yes, he, he merges it with, with the Torah and the story of Isaiah. It's the same story. The coming of the kingdom, return from exile, Jesus, 
uh, as the king. It's all mushed together now because of what he did with Isaiah 52. So, um, I would say now mm -hmm. creation would not have given this message. I, I would think not. I would agree with you. Right. So I would think, which is why this passage is problematic if it's talking about merely talking about creation. That's where the crux of the problem is. If he can't sit around, if, if, he, if he says, but I asked, have they heard? Of course they have. And he cites this passage, seems to confirm that they have heard. That seems a very strange way to end the argument. Right? He should be saying, no, they haven't heard. So I think what Steve is proposing, uh, Stephen is proposing is that this passage actually refers to the whole of Psalm 19, which elevates the coming of the Torah of the Torah. Right? The Torah is now up here. Um, and, and that's necessary, and you need to, we need people to proclaim that part. And that somehow these two verses is supposed to communicate all of that. Okay, okay, another question on no. verse 16. It says, yeah. but not all have obeyed. And all. It's talking about not all the Jews have obeyed, right? Or, well, I think all the people who have heard. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's basically you proclaim, and then the response is various. Now, the, qu the question here is, is the focus on the all on the Jews or on the Gentiles? Or is it both? And I'm, I'm, it's not clear to me that it's one or the uh, Jews or Gentiles. I think it just basically, the, the, the gospel has been proclaimed to a lot of different people and not all of them have, have believed the message. I can't remember another verse that says, um, they hear, they understand it. Oh, is it kind of related to that? Yeah. Remember that verse when it says, okay, do they hear, but they do not understand? Do not, do not hear, right. They, they hear their ears, but they don't understand. It's been in a stupid Isaiah, the Isaiah passage. Uh, uh, no, 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 Jer wait. It is Isaiah. Yeah. Okay. If, I'm thinking if it is kind of, they heard the gospel, but they cannot understand. Like yeah. They heard it, but if it is, a, if it is talking about the Jews, so they will not be able to understand which... They spoke about it before. I, I think you, I, well, I agree with you, and it's coming up in this passage. There's a whole bunch of passages which you know, they're in a sense, they're in a, a kind of a state of stupor, and they can't seem to get it. Um, that's part of this as well. Um, but so the question I, I think you're getting at is the whole idea of not believing the gospel. You, you want to say that's, we have, that has a lot of echo to the Jews. Um, and in fact, the next section is really asking why don't the Jews get it? Um, I, my difficulty is faced with the fact that this, uh, this question, this, this section, occurs in the middle of a passage that's focused on, I think, Gentile mission. Right? Um, um, because it's focused on no distinction between Jews and Greeks. He's saying, look, the culmination of the scripture is to preach the gospel to, 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 to the Gentiles. So it's, it's no distinction between Jews and Greeks, same Lord for of all, and everyone who calls on him, they the Lord will be saved. Well, how can they call him if they haven't believed? How can they believe they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching? That seems to be about, well, Gentile slash Jews as well, but... You know, you know what I'm saying? It's it's the bigger story of Jesus. Is, isn't it like in the same passage also when it says that God kind of um, hardened their hearts so that once of the full the fullness of the Gentile? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 next week. That's that's the big that's the big big discussion, okay? Because it says all Israel will be saved, and we're just gonna building toward that, okay? And that's gonna be like what the I don't know. There's a gazillion options. There's gonna be a big old mess. But you're right, and, and it's, it's it's gonna be interesting. And, and so that's ne next time, not next week, but next time, okay? That's that's the all Israel will be saved passage. Um, yeah, I, I, I face that with, with, tr with, with trembling. Um, okay. but, but thank you for the suggestion. I'm putting it down. I'm looking forward f further into it because I think that's an interesting way of reading that passage um, that, that makes sense of what's going on. Um, but I'm going to uh, go on with 19 as coming back to the question, but I ask, uh, did they not know? Not know about what? Not know that the Gentiles... Are the, the Gentile mission is, is heart and, the heart and core of the Torah. Do they not know that? How can they not know that? Right? They studied this all day long. I mean, that's, that's what they're about. Well, so, uh, how can they not know this? How can, the, how can they not know that the whole point of the Torah is the Messiah? Well, um, and his point is, was this hidden? I guess is the point. And, and Paul's point is, it's not hidden. It's right there in the text the whole time. They just haven't been reading it. 
properly. They were warned long ago the Gentiles are coming in and they're going to cause Israelites to become angry and jealous because they seem to be sharing if not taking over the promise made to the Israelites. The first of this is from Deuteronomy 32. I will make you jealous regarding to what is not a nation. With a senseless nation will I make you angry. I just great. Gentiles are senseless nations. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, let's take a look at that one. Um, Deuteronomy 32. Once again, we're talking about the end of the Torah. So, okay. Yahweh saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom there is, in whom is no faithfulness. They have stirred me to jealousy with what is not no God. They have provoked me with their idols. So I will stir them to jealousy with those who are no people. I will provoke them with a foolish nation. Okay. So you worship other, you worship idols, I will bring in the Gentiles. All right, I can handle that. It's not a great metaphor for Gentile. For, like, as a Gentile, objection. I feel a little, I feel a little dissed here. Sorry. Okay. There's a little bit of that going on. Uh, at the same time, you know, we have early, earlier passages in which were vessels bound for glory, and and you know, and Israel is the clay pot that's you know for for ignoble purpose. I'm like, okay. All right, fine. Maybe we have, Paul's balancing things out here, but in Deuteronomy, it definitely has this Israelite orientation. Look. You're the ch your children. You're elected. You're you're the you're descendants of Abraham, the person that God just really had this you know really great relationship with because he's like he believes in me, he trusts me. What a great faithful person. You're his children, and you guys are a mess. You know what? You worship other gods. I'm gonna bring another people. I'm gonna bring another people to me. I'm gonna bring people who are no people into into them, and I will provoke you with a foolish nation. Okay. For a fire is kindled by my anger, and it burns to the death of Sheol, devours the earth, and it's increased, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. Okay. Apocalyptic imagery. Okay, so, um, for Paul, we have a prophecy of the entrance of the Gentiles right here in the Torah, in the words of Moses. It's already here. Okay. Once again, read the Torah. Wait a minute, hey, there's stuff here going on that's rather surprising. Okay. Um, Actually, let me make sure we read that passage, the whole thing. Isaiah is bold and says, I was found by those who are not seeking me. I became manifest to those who are not asking me. And to Israel, he says, all day long I stretch out my hands to a people disobedient and argumentative. Okay, and that's out of Isaiah 65. Um, so, pretty clear. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation that did not call on my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and burning incense upon bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh and broth of the abominable things that is in their vessels, who say, who say, keep to yourself and do not come near me, for I am set apart from you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. So God is not happy with the way Israelites keep their, keep their, cult, keep their worship practices and who have no interest in God. And so what he does, according to Paul, is look, he's really looking at people who did not, who, he's saying, um, he, so he takes verse one, he reads it as reference to Gentiles. And verse two, a reference to Jews. Are these ways that they worship other, other gods? Yeah. Like these stories? Well, uh, so, so, they, they, so it's about burning incense upon. So there's there, there are different ways of sacrificing and doing and, and burning incense, which references to probably idolatry of some sort. And there's like sitting in tombs, spending the night in secret places. I'm not sure what that's about. Yeah, some mean, kind of divination, some kind of access kind of to worship. magic, dark magic. Okay. Yeah, you know, people are very superstitious. They're gonna do all kinds of interesting things uh, in ways to actually try to, you know, gain power. Um, you know, just think back a couple hundred years. You're talking about witchcraft, those kind of things. That's kind of what they're, what's, what's going on here. Um, Yah wisdom has always been difficult because God is understood as a person who is sovereign, who to make decisions. And for ancient religion, uh, the key to religion is not have not it's not really about covenant with God or or fulfilling God's plan for the world. It's usually about manipulation of the divine sphere for your own personal purposes. 
right? So the simple ones, so the simplest one is you have your own personal deity. In the ancient world, people have their own personal deity. You pray to them, you give them a gift, they give you something back in return. And if that doesn't work, then you, you go into a different realm, you know, what we call voodoo today. Magical rites, incantations, ways to manipulate and bind the divine world into accomplishing what you, what you accomplished. Right? Because those are the traditional ways in which religion has functioned. Having a God who is personal and sovereign, who actually, you can't bind him to do anything, and having a relationship with him, and then he actually have expectations on you, that was very difficult for Israel. And uh, that's the, the problem. Uh, comment. I think the, the Kabbalah allows you to like influence the actions of God. It's really? Yeah, I think so. How do you do that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's just curious. Right, so there's a, there's a lot of things, a lot of religion are in, in ways, in, in, and I know that anytime you, Christianity can be done that way too, there's, there's branches of Christianity in which you have you know, ways of breathing, ways of incantation, that ways of making sure God does certain things. Um, and, and I think the, 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 the one primary message is a, a personal God in the Bible. That this God is a full-on person who has his own plans and own thoughts and own beliefs and own emotions and looks at you and go, hey, here's another person I want to talk and have a relationship with and you can ask me to do things, but, you know, there's no guarantee I'll do it. And there's nothing, none of it, there's nothing you can do about it, <laughs> okay? That version, vision of a God um, is, is actually, for many, very difficult. Okay? For, for throughout, throughout, the history, throughout, throughout the history of Israel, it's been very difficult. For context, do you know how yeah. much about the Babylonian God? How the Babylonian? So, like I said, uh, the, what I talk about the personal gods is, is out of, mostly out of the uh, um, uh, the Babylonian or Mesopotamian area. So, people have you have national gods, city gods, and you actually have personal gods. So, you can actually switch them. So, I have a god, and I and I will worship that god. And that's not like my household deity. And if that god is not working, like he's not giving me what I want, I switch to a different god. So that's actually, that's not something unknown, this idea of a, of a personal God that you, that kind of, with you and your family. And they're supposed to take care of you if you take care of them. What about like, what was the God of Babylon? Marduk. Marduk, and what was yeah. he, he? So he was kind of, he's like the patron deity of the king, of the emperor. So, you know, he's the one emperor, so, 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 so Marduk, uh, um, you know, gives power, empowers the whole nation. But individual people don't all have to worship Marduk, they worship their own deity. But of, of course, the whole society has, you know, Mar Marduk practices, uh, uh, cultic practices. Yeah, yes. If they do the cultic practices, then Marduk will make them prosperous. Exactly. So there's really no. Um, there's some as 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 these kind of um, 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 religion developed, they became slightly more ethical oriented. Early on, the early gods were very unethical. The early kind of nature gods, as they became, they developed gods developed, developed council. Which is very standard. The Council of the Gods is a very standard move. Is that you need to find a way to get these gods together and have them stop fighting and killing each other, at least in the storylines. So the gods begin to re reflect human government in the sense that you have the high god, you have the different pantheons, and different people, different gods are assigned to different places. Like, just to create like, some like kind of order. Greek like the Greek cosmology, exactly. Yeah, right. so, the, so El was the high god in King, <coughs> Marduk was the high god in Babylon. You have things like that going on in the, the Greco-Roman world as well. Uh, very similar. In the earliest uh, stories, we're all very wild and very unethical, and as a gradual, as, as human civilization got became more organized, the divine, divine sphere reflected that. Okay? But even then, there's a lot of room for caprice, a lot of room for the gods doing whatever they want. Okay? And the idea of a, of, a, of a demand for morality really isn't there for humans. It's just more of a, I, you know, I'm bonded to you, I, you like, I, I serve you. It's personal loyalty lies at the heart of, heart of the uh, relationship, not any kind of ethical demands. So I think what happens is in our Christian, in our Christian faith, we've actually switched over and we've lost we in some ways lost the sense of personal loyalty and moved almost entirely to ethical, right? So a lot of people say, well, if I, if I do good and never, never make any mistake, can I go to heaven? People have that question. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you forgot the loyalty part, okay? You have completely lost the, the, the per interpersonal dimension of relationship with God. All you have is, it's ethical. So, the, the Christianity is a merging of the ethical, personal, uh, ethical and personal dimension, um, and which is why, which is why, when you t to a certain extent, the, the the modern, the new perspective is really kind of restoring that personal aspect. 
Right? I tell people, you know, people always ask, a person who doesn't, who's not Christian, who lives a perfect life, can they go to heaven? I say no, because they're rebelling against God. They, 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 they're in, they, they, are, they, they are not obeying the, the, the emperor, therefore they are considered a rebel. I don't care how well they live their life as a rebel. Okay? You're in rebellion against the, the, the legitimate ruler of the universe, and you live the great life being nice to people around you. Great. <laughs> You're still in rebellion against the emperor. <laughs> Sorry. That doesn't help you. Right? You, need to be, you need to be not in rebellion, be restored to relationship with the emperor of the, of the universe. And then the emperor universe says, okay, now you're part of my people. There are expectations. You're supposed to live a certain way to reflect my character. Okay? So to live out this fullness of the life that I, I have given you. So the ethical, the personal mission, which meshes together. Um, I don't know how we got on that. Pretty good, though. Thanks. It's a good question. Um, okay. So it, it, there was something starting with, with like um, uh, voodoo coming out of this and such. Right. It, it, okay, I I don't I don't see that. Isn't it just kind of going through a list of things that would have made people unclean, and yet they're they're still claiming no, I'm still special, even though they're so yeah, clearly right. violating. Right. But of why them. are they there? Why are they in? Oh, why are they in the tomb? In the tombs? Why are they spending night in secret places? Why are they eating swine's flesh? Well, I don't know about that part. <laughs> Maybe it tastes good? Maybe it tastes good? Maybe tombs... Oh, nice. I don't know. Yeah, tombs are nice places. Yeah. No, no. no. Like shady and cool. No, no, no. The, 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 injunctioning is divin the injunctioning is divination and sorcery is huge in the Bible. Okay, the Old Testament is like, no divination, no sorcery, no attempt to manipulate the divine sphere, because God is not like that. When you, when you try to do that, you're fundamentally misimaging God, okay, who is not subject, subject to manipulation. So no, no sorcery, no divination, no you know, trying to figure out the future, any kind of stuff, be, for those reasons. Because you, because you somehow, you, 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 are, you are misstating who God is. But you're right, th these people who do this, then they go ahead and think, you know, they're being hypo hypocritical here. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. So verse one is about, about Gentiles, verse two is about Jews. Um, okay. So, Quick summary, because we're heading up to chapter 11. Do we have time? Okay, we're, we're, I think we're good. Okay. The story of Israel is one of selection and separation guided by God's hand. Is that fair? Because Israel's clay, rebellious, obstinate people that would have vanished long ago without God's gracious intervention. What is the point of the selection and separation? The story of Israel grinds on until it reaches the Messiah. Okay. The story of Israel, the point of the Torah, converges into the person of Jesus. By his enthronement, the promise of Abraham is thrown open to the Gentiles. Israelites who seek to remain, re maintain their advantage as the chosen people refuse to accept this revelation even though they have been warned by Moses and Isaiah. Okay, there are people who just like, they're missing the point because they have not read the Torah properly. Okay. So, we're coming to the final chapter of Roman 9 through 11. Any questions on this? Kind of general trajectory so far. Okay. Well, verse, left, uh, verse 1, chapter, chapter 11. Um, uh, let me set this up a bit. Um, so we're approaching this kind of this tremendous section in Roman and Pauline writing, uh, and it's very controversial. Um, the controversy surrounds Romans eleven twenty six: all Israel will be saved. We're getting to that already. Um, all kinds of theories about exactly how and when and who will be saved. Okay. Uh, the 20th century, th that verse has become a fault line among theologians. Um, after the Holocaust, there's a great, begin, become this big argument for what is known as a two-covenant theology. Okay. God will save the Israelites to the, to the old covenant, and God will save the Gentiles to the new covenant. So both covenants work. There's no need for Jews to actually convert and believe Jesus. A two-covenant theology. Okay. So you, you'll hear this discussion, because this happens, especially if you walk out of the evangelical world, um, you know, you have a supersession, you know, replacement theology, there's all these types of stuff going on, and, and you have, you know, especially within ecumenism, um, a, a strong rejection of proselytizing, mm -hmm. right? You, hear, you sense that proselytizing is bad. Proselyt you know, wh why would you want to proselytize the Jews? Um, that's the kind of question that gets asked, and, and underlying that is this two covenant theology. That if Jews are already part of the kingdom of God, why would you want to turn to the Christians for? 
Okay. So that's kind of the question that's underlying this. Now, if you, you know, we've been gone through Romans, if you look at Romans 1 through 8 with me, that this reading of two covenant theology is really not a possibility. Jews or Gentiles are both being under the power of sin, Christ being the culmination of the Torah, and even here we have Romans 9 through 11, right? We have this history of Israel's clay and the entire approach um, that comes out of the Torah. Torah leads to Christ. So they're not really separate covenants. It's not possible. If you have Torah leading to Christ as being the natural, essential core essence of what Torah is all about, then how can you say, have the Torah for the Jews and have Jesus for the Gentiles? That makes no sense. Okay, so I, I'm, we're, I'm not going to deal with, I, I don't find two covenant theology um, convincing and I'm not going to go that way, but just making sure that you actually know that's out there. Um, Two explicit questions, chapter 11. Did God cast off his people, and did they stumble so as to fall? So here's the first part. And the next part is, did they stumble so as to fall? And, and they introduced the two major sections in this chapter. Um, and Okay. I would like to turn the question around, and, and we can see a little better. Um, he asked these questions. I'm going to ask the other question. The first question, I think, is, can any Jew be saved? And the second question is, can any more Jews be saved? Okay, let's, let, let's see. Uh, that will become clear once we look at the text. Therefore, I ask, did God not cast off his people? Of course not. Okay, remember, can any Jew be saved? For I am an Israelite from the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. Hey, okay. God did not cast off his people from whom he foreknew. Okay, so, so uh, no, let, let's not read the whole thing. Let's get to this part. Okay. Um, did you see what just happened there? Are the Jews completely cast off? I mean, he's been telling the story about the Jews are shrinking down, they, they, they're, they're clay, they're being used for, for ignoble purposes, culminating in Christ, now the door's open to the Gentiles. What about Jews? Are they completely cast off? The answer is no. Of course not, for I am an Israelite. You got at least one Jew. <laughs> Proof positive that God has not cast off his people. So I'm gonna, like I said, can any Jew be saved, and can any more Jew be saved? It's the second question. Let's just kind of see it that way. Because you see his answer, right? I'm an Israelite from the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. Ding, 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 ding. One Jew is saved. Charles, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can sure. we, I know we've talked about this a lot, but can sure. we just briefly elaborate on what we mean by being saved? Just briefly. Okay. Um, so for Paul, um, salvation is... Uh, we, um, a being being a, a rescued and freed from oppression. Salvation, like <coughs> Paul, biblical understanding of salvation. So Yeshua, uh, um, uh, uh, Yeshua in, in, in the Old Testament and, and New Testament Soterion, both have political sal salvation in mind. You were previously slaves, and now you're set free. In the Old Testament, in various ways, they were set free from uh, slavery to Egypt. Uh, they were set free from, set free from exile in Babylon, uh, the salvation idea. In the New Testament, the salvation is from sin and death. Okay, So there's a sense, I mean, obviously salvation, um, so salvation is, is, is one aspect of the gospel. Okay? It's, it's a lens toward freedom from slavery. Lens. If you see, the, so you imagine gospel is a kind of a complex idea of the coming of the kingdom of God. There's a lot of elements to it. If you put on the salvation lens, it's oh, you're no longer a slave to sin and death. Okay, so that's a big deal. Um, so when I say save, in a, in a sense, I'm I'm using that as a short uh, as a shorthand for because I think that's a that's a common shorthand for basically joining the covenant, the new covenant, being the covenant people of God, of which when you're saved, you are part of that. But you're right. Save. When I say save, it's actually kind of narrowed. So, yeah. Okay. So, did God not cast off his people? Of course not. Jew, you know. and, and now this is a really simple point. Okay, great. But it actually uh, counters any replacement theology, which some people have ventured that, that Gentile church replaces the Jewish people. And that's not right either. Okay, so you have one is a two covenant theory theology. I'm, I'm bringing a lot of customs about theology in here because this is where the battleground is and these kind of issues are showing up. There's any kind of replacement theology is Gentile replacing the Jews. What actually happens is that with the Christ, God now welcomes both into the people of God. There's an so wide invasion. Yes, they unify. We're unifying Jews and Gentiles into one people. There's no distinction. That's the point that Paul's been pushing the whole time. Stop this Jews separate from, from Gentile. No, they're all in via Christ, who is the Jewish Messiah. He is Jewish. 
which is the part that's like really hard to get across. Yeah, Jesus is Jewish. We're, we're inviting people to into a Jewish faith in which Gentiles are now open to join in, but so are the Jews, because Jew, Jews also need them to be joining the Messiah as well. Okay, but today it's kind of weird because Christianity is so thought of as, as a Gentile faith, right? And if, indeed, you can, I think with Israel, if you're a Christian, a Jew, you may have, you may have a hard time trying to immigrate to Israel. Um, I, I, that's what I've been told, but I'm not sure, certain on that. There, there's ex, they, they exclude Christians, um, Christian Jews, because they say you're no longer Jewish. Um, it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a very strange uh, situation, the, what the 2,000 year history has done for us. Okay, so we see that, right? So God, God did not cast off his people whom he foreknew. Okay. For, for, or did you know that it was says by Elijah in scripture how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altar and I'm left alone and they seek my life. More Old Testament references. And, and what did the divine reply say to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to Baal. Therefore also at the present time there is remnant according to a gracious choice. But if grace, then no longer from works. Otherwise grace will no longer be grace. Okay. First of all, God did not cast off people whom he foreknew. It does not mean simply that God sees the future and knows things ahead of time. All right. So, so biblical concept of knowledge is always personal and intimate. It's never a distant knowing. It's, it's intimate. So foreknowing is a, is a form of love or grace. God foreknew his people, his people of Israel. He, he knew them ahead of time, and, and he, he reaches out in advance and reveals love and, and solicits it, kind of an answering love. Um, or to reveal a particular purpose and, and call forth obedience. Uh, and you see this passage. The passage you see cites, it's very interesting. He did not cast off his people, he's talking about Israel, uh, ethnic Israel, whom he foreknew. Foreknowledge does not mean that they will, re they will actually um, respond properly. Right? They rebel, they have killed your prophets, they have torn your altar. These are people God has foreknew, has foreknown. Okay? So foreknowledge does not does not negate uh, human choice in, in rejecting God. Okay? God pours out a love, prior grace, reaching out, and the people is free to reject God in the process. And they do that right here in this passage. Um, so God has not cast off his people, and so we're going to look at Elijah real quick. Uh, the quote from Elijah was very zealous for God, and well, okay. Um, and you might remember the story. Uh, Elijah goes ahead and um, um, challenges the priest of Baal in this massive showdown, and then God, which is a miracle, burns up all the meat, makes massive barbecue, and uh, and they kill. He kills all the priests of Baal. Okay. And then what happens afterwards? He thought, well, this is great. Rain's coming down. I've won. And then no, he hasn't. The political structure is such that Ahab still has Ahab, the king of the north, has all the power. His wife Je uh, Jeze uh, Jezebel, Jezebel um, says, "I'm going to you know what you did to them. I'm going to do it to you." And it's like Elijah's like, okay, from the height of triumph to the pit of despair, nothing's changed. The whole people seem to have. I mean, the people who saw the miracle, they killed them all. Nothing's transformed. Nothing's changed. So he goes on the run, and he goes hide. He hides out in the mountains. And he, he looks for God, and he, you know, he says, I want to die. Okay? He kept this, this whining bit thing going on. And then he says, Lord, they have killed your prophet, they torn out your altar, I've left alone, they seek my life. And God said, he, gave, he says a whole bunch of things, but at the end he says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed down to Baal. Okay. So, Elijah is focused on Israel's apostasy, and they're drifting away from the covenant, and God reassures them that there is a remnant. Okay. In this storyline, move to, to take the story and move it to Paul's time. Paul's looking at Israel's apostasy. He's in Elijah's position. Okay. And God's really saying to him, there is a remnant. There is going to be people. There is also at the present time, there is a remnant according to a gracious choice. There's going to be people left over. Elijah didn't know about the 5,000. Who, have, who, have, who, are, who are God has maintained for himself. And Paul, in the same position, he's hearing the same thing. God is, God is putting a remnant together okay, of, of, of Israelites. Um, there will be more Jews who, who will proclaim Jesus the Messiah. Okay. So, so um, remnant theology, if you read Isaiah, you will find there's a remnant idea showing up repeatedly. There's always been this gradual separation between 
national ethnic Israel with true Israel, right? It's just kind of just kind of they're being, they're being the two ideas being pulled pulled apart in in, in the uh, uh, being pulled apart in 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 in, in the prophetic uh, stories because the ethnic Israel is so rebellious. There's always something left over, and the leftover piece actually um, we were talking about this in the Old Testament theology class. The story of Naaman, the Syrian general. He actually becomes a Yahweh worshiper, and he doesn't join Israel at all. So this true Israel actually, in some sense, gets it's no longer one circle within another circle. There's actually a little piece that sticks out. Okay, or we already have the story of a Gentile who is a Yahweh worshiper, part member of true Israel, but who is not ethnic Israel and doesn't live in Israel and doesn't participate in their national community. Okay, that, that idea starts are showing up already in the Old Testament, and then and then he actually become, he's actually the the general for a for for Syria who is in charge of fighting battles against Israel. Which is just, that's just great. Okay, well, Yahweh wish for attacking Israel. Yes. Okay, this is great. So, so and, 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 and the, the prophet Elisha was totally fine with it. It's like, oh, go, go in peace. Enjoy. It. <laughs> it's like, okay, no problem. Become a Yahweh wish for Go. Have fun. Uh, so, we have this remnant idea, and the remnant idea should, in the first, by the time the first century is very prominent. The people in the Essenes, people in the Desi Scroll people, they consider themselves the remnant. Okay. Nobody thinks. Okay. By then, no Jewish sect believed that everybody is a true Israelite. Nobody believed that all Jews are true Israelites. They just don't. Sadducees. Pff, they're collaborative Romans, so they're not part of the true Israelite. The Pharisees. Okay. We're we're the true Israelites. Those people who are not up holding the Torah properly. They're kind of outside. The Essenes. Now we're we're here in the desert waiting for God, and we don't participate in the temple because the temple is polluted because we uh, the high priest is not really an ironic priesthood. Right, so we have all these different groups are saying that we're the remnant, we're the true people, true Israelite. The whole group cannot be, okay, because we have a bunch of people who are living in sins. They're living in, in collaboration with the Romans. They're living in a Greek culture. Okay, so Paul is arguing along with them in that line that Jewish Christians are the remnant. There is a remnant of Jewish Christians, okay, and they are saved by grace. A gracious choice. Well, now the question really would be how then, or uh, would the, jo the Jews join this remnant, or when? You know, when is this gonna, all going to happen? But he doesn't. He goes to, to a different question. Um, he, has a, he, he goes back and again describes Israel's situation. Okay. He kind of, I mean, this is, his, he, he's taking like a step forward and he's taking a step backward again, you know what I'm saying? We've already seen this section about Israelites missing the point. And then we move forward, okay, the, there's going to be a remnant, and then he brings this back again. Uh, so, I mean, okay. So what then, what, what Israel seeks after, what Israel seeks after it did not obtain, but the chosen obtained, and the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that do not see, and ears that do not hear, until this very day. And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and may they bend their backs continually. Okay. So, we're not dividing between two groups of people, uh, the chosen and the rest. Okay. And uh, we're back to, we're talking, so we're talking about within Israel, some are, you remember what he said here? By grace. So there's, there's a gracious choice. God has chosen a remnant within Israel. And the chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. And it echoes back to our discussion about God having mercy on those who have mercy, uh, about the golden calf, about, about the Pharaoh. Um, Israel reached the culmination of her history in Jesus, and it continues in the same state right, of hardness. There's still kind of this clay that's kind of corrupt. So God steps in and chose some and harden others. Paul, ch chosen. Right? He, I think he has a tremendous sense of chosenness. And I can understand based on his experience. He, without that encounter with Jesus, would he have actually turned and said, this is, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> 
for, for Paul, it's like, yeah, among the Jews, there are people who are chosen, and they're like, and the rest, they seem to be hardened by this, by this gospel. Okay. Um, so we have hardening going on, and and in which there's a there's a yeah. So hang on a second. What passage is this? We need to. So we're dealing with the stupor passage, and there we go. Sorry, let me let me latch it. Deuteronomy 29. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that Yahweh did before your eyes in the land of Egypt. He just, he just loves Deuteronomy, doesn't he? At the end of Deuteronomy. Uh, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and all his land, the great trials which you, I saw, the signs, the great wonders. But to this day, Yahweh has not given you a mind to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out upon you and your sandals have not worn your feet. Have, have not worn off your feet. Okay. They're, they're not seen. Right? Isaiah 29. So, so Deuteronomy had the idea that the thing, you, you can't see what's right in front of you. Verse 20, Isaiah 29, stupefy yourselves and be in a stupor. Blind yourselves to be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For Yahweh has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads and seer, the seers. And the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Okay. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. Okay, so. But the Lord says, for the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment of men learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will again do marvelous thing with this people, wonderful and marvelous. And the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hid. Okay. So both have a similar idea. You have a, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in this passage about uh, Israelites, um, they saw the sign, they saw great wonders. But because of the lack of faith, they end up not being able to see things that are right in front of them. So by the time, I mean, they, they walked around for 40 years, their shoes didn't wear off. And they didn't see it. It's just it's like, it's almost like right in front of them, it's, it's just blanked out. There, there's this, the, he's getting a kind of a sense of hardening that comes on people who don't have faith. Okay. And this is, the same, this is the same idea as the Golden Calf episode, as well as Pharaoh. Now these people are not doing genocide. But when you see great things and don't respond to it, then somehow hardening occurs. Okay. I don't, I, don't know, I don't want to generalize this to, 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 to individuals' lives, but sometimes you, you hear people, this actually, I was reading this um, study um, in the book called Move, by, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, you know that church in Chicago, really big, what's it called? Help me out here. Bulo Creek, thank you. They published this book and they're talking about how people who are, who, who come to church within five years, if they don't become Christian or get really dedicated, they stop being able to. Okay, there's something about us that when we encounter something, and if there's no radical change or radical commitment, it, it dulls us, inoculates us for further transformation. There's that initial period. Um, I'm saying that not as a way of saying that's what this is saying, but a way, a way of illustrating the same idea. That there's a very similar principle at work when you see something that God has done, and then. When your reaction is, uh, you know, then what happens is you, you're now dead, you're dulled away from ever able to react. Charles, is this yes. like similar to what is uh, occurring in, in the Gospels when, when the Pharisees are witnessing what Jesus is doing? Yeah. And they're sort of saying, well, yeah. by which power is doing that? And they're yes. using to see the obvious. Yes, yes. So it's, it's actually a, a, a huge part of the, of the Gospels is about inability to see what's right in front of them. And, and, and when they see it, they see it in through lenses that makes no sense. Um, and you, you look at them going, really? How could you think that? Oh, a, a tremendous miracle just happened. Oh my gosh, he, made, he did it on the Sabbath. Oh, no, no. You know, it's time for the Inquisition. Like, wait a minute. A miracle just happened. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Somebody just, their eyes, they're able to see now. Holy cow. You know, it's like this, this incomprehensibility for us readers. But that's the whole idea. Is that the author is trying to, for, the, the gospel is showing you, you your reaction is, that's really cool. And look at the reaction. You think, wait a minute. Why is there a huge gap? And in, in, in that, exposing a, 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 a hardening 
of, of the, the, their, their, their eyes have, have been shut off in some ways. And, and Paul's really saying that God's kind of doing this. That if your reaction is initially lack of marvel, then I'm going to blind you. And here too, you know, it's like everything's covered up. Book is sealed up. It gives the person who can't, we can't read it, right? And I'm going to do marvelous things with these people. I'm going to do great things with these people, and they won't be able to understand any of it. Okay? Well, that's just great. And, that, and this passage really confirms what Paul's getting at. God says, this is a clay piece of clay, and I'm going to just use it to accomplish the things I want to accomplish. But the clay itself will remain rebellious and, and not comprehending all the way through, which then takes us to the initial question, which is, can any Jew be saved? And Paul says, yeah, there's one. And there's going to be a remnant because God's going to pick them up. Is that, is that how they fit together? Okay. The flip side of that really yeah. seems to go back to, to some of the the common struggle with these these chapters that mm -hmm. I mean that, that you're kind of educating us against. Um, if if God so hardens people, what does that make of Paul's missionary journey? I mean, isn't isn't evangelism then to a certain extent well well mandated? And so obedience is obedience and a, yeah. a good in yeah. its own because yeah. Paul has to Paul has to obey. Right. Um, but aside from that, isn't to a certain extent then evangelism almost working against the the work of God? Keep going. As he, as he hardens as he hardens people, so you pr presenting the, the gospel to them is like running up against a wall that God has or ordained. Um, okay, so so the hardening so far in this story focuses on the Israelites. Right. He hasn't talked about hardening Gentiles. Right. The only person he actually talked about being hardened is actually the Pharaoh. The, that's the old, the, the old story, the whole story so far, according to Paul, that's the only person he's hardened. Um, so, or, or put in a stupor. Right. Um, which is, leads to an interesting question, why are the Jews singled out for, for such horrible treatment? That's because God revealed himself and they didn't respond properly. Okay, so the, so the question you might be asking is, if we pre present the gospel and people don't respond, then they might harden. Which, if you, if you take that parallel behavior uh, ongoing, you might actually, uh, the presentation of the gospel done poorly, sometimes can harden people, which is actually a well-known phenomenon. That there's entire campuses that are completely wiped out for, gospel, for Christianity because of the, 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 the incredibly insensitive ways the gospel is spread, or, or just the wrong ways the gospel is spread. Um, and that happens too. And I, and, I, and, I, and I look at our society, American society, and I wonder whether we're in the process of hardening the society against the gospel by the way in which Many members of the, of the evangelical conservative faith, the things they focus on, the things they say, and, and the attitude they express, and, and the way the mass media then cause that to go out there to, to, to kind of produce this view of, of conservative Christians that I really don't recognize, but it's out there, and it, you know, we, we're, we're, move, we're moving fast into a post-Christian society, and we're doing it, we're contributing to it. That's kind of why I'm seeing things. It's the spirit versus the letter, isn't it? Is it not the like mm -hmm. the the opposition between the spirit of Christianity yeah. and, the, and the letter? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, we, you know, I'm, I just you know, we are we're we're, we're obscenely focused on sex. I don't know why. Mm. Right. So it's a puritanical. Inheritance. It's a puritan right? But but we are just we're focused on right now. You know, it's it's contraception, abortion. I mean, we're just in homosexuality. We're just zoned in on these things. <laughs> It's like, really? I mean, why is that the big issue? Well, the mass media, I mean. Mass media praise it up. Yeah, I know, but so I'm, I'm having a hard, how do you get the rest of the messages out? You're right? So, so what, is, what is the gospel about? Um, and how do, we, how do we get it out there so that we don't have a society that's, that views Christians as being a certain way? The, young people, the young, younger generation is leaving the church in mass numbers. Right? They're ditching Christianity. I mean, the numbers out there are astounding what the next generation looks like. We have a sea change coming up. And, and, and a lot of this because Christianity is associated with certain extreme positions. Um, and how do you... Yeah, sorry. I, I believe that during the Middle Ages in, in Europe, uh, sexuality wasn't such a, like a, a negative thing. I mean, it, the, yeah. the relationship to the body was very different. And it wasn't such a... Like, um, I mean, you, you read a lot of accounts and novels and stuff of people <laughs> having sex. And yeah. mm -hmm. It wasn't, I don't think it was so frowned upon at the time. Yeah. 
it's interesting to. Well, I, I mean, it's not. It's not necessarily if this is right or wrong. It's just I think we have we we we've over focused on certain things, right? It's like okay, yeah, okay. We the evangelicals, we we are. I think we are. When we what we say about homosexuality fits. If we're standing on the Bible. Yes, that's great. But why are we talking about this? There's so many other things to talk about. Where, where was the church on, on, on torture? You know, where, where were the people just, you know, standing up, shouting against, shout, shout, shouting, you know, on, on that? I don't know. Um, it just there's a lot of things we're not talking about that we should be. So, anyway, um, we're getting political here, <laughs> but it's but it's the principle at work. When, when we preach the gospel. And if it comes out, and the initial action goes out wrong, there's a hardening that starts up. I think the principle that Paul that Paul's talking about here, it seems to play out universally. Okay. So is that then God hardening by way of us, just like God can reach people by way of us? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, is, is, is God's agent as a way the human human God has made humanity in this way? Um, I mean. I would say this. I mean, a Gentile person, I mean, a person who hears the gospel poor, the poorly has a very negative view of, of Christianity. It's hard to imagine that God says, oh, you, 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 you had a very negative view of Christianity, therefore I'm going to harden you. That's very different than what he's talking about with the Israelites, who have seen, the, you know, who have received the Abraham covenant, seen the wonders of ex Exodus, and seen what God has done repeatedly in their lives, and then had just rebel, rebel, rebel. I'm thinking, yeah, so. I'm thinking more of the, the, the broader sense that, that came out of the discussion with, with Pharaoh. Pe you know, mm -hmm. People are in rebellion, therefore God can do whatever he want, wants with them. Right. And yeah, that's in the clay with respect to, to Israel, right. but, but it also play, plays out for, for Pharaoh, which suggests a, a broadness to it. So, yeah. so to, a certain, to a certain extent, um, can bad evangelism then be the equivalent of the plagues of Egypt being visited upon <laughs> people? Huh, interesting. Well, so, so, this yeah, campus, yeah. This, I mean, this campus has been in rebellion, they deserve whatever they get, I'm going to reveal my glory by sending yeah. them some really lousy evangelists. <laughs> I, I would say, oh, wow. I, so I, 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 know, I know that there's a tendency to draw equivalences like you know oh well fair I would say there's a big difference between Pharaoh and and most I would say most I mean look there, there's been places and, and societies in which their 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 rebellion and their inhumanity has reached level of Pharaoh there's been no doubt about that and and those people deserve whatever God wants to do with them but I would also say many many non-christians are not living lives of genocidal, you know, um, um, a maniacal, you know, uh, kind of, you know, lives. And they're not, they're not acting like Pharaoh, and so I don't think they're deserving of really bad evangelists. <laughs> yeah, come with. Say, when when you present the gospel, like, there is no like perfect way to do it, right? Mm, no. And I think even when someone may do like um. A bad job, but it is still the Holy Spirit that is working and saving people. I, I agree. Like, in a way, it's, it, I would not say that it's bad evangelism that causing this in a way because yeah. I can still save people yeah. who do bad stuff. I think I think we make two distinctions. We make a distinction between um, <coughs> what God can do in redeeming the horrible things we do. That's a common biblical theme. Humans make mistake, God redeem it. But the second theme is, we're not therefore, uh, not accountable to our mistakes. So, I would say, yes, God can bring people to faith, even through a very bad evangelist who goes up and tell them they're all going to hell. That's okay. You go up there and preach fire, fire, you know, fire and brimstone on, 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 on Library Mall. And I, there used to be this guy who does this back in the... Um, a few, it's like a decade ago. This, this guy who come, was out, out at the library mall who was doing not this. Not even that old. Not even that long, long ago? Okay. <laughs> Last semester, really? It's been that recent? Well, yeah. it may not be the same guys. Guy. A bunch of guys coming through, right? And they're just coming in and just calling everybody going to hell. It's just, it's just horrible stuff. Okay, yes, God can redeem that, and some one person might. But when God doesn't, then the, 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 he, lets, he lets the consequence plays out, play out. He is, that, person, that person doing that job, 
he is still held responsible. We're, we're held responsible to do the best job we can to pre in preaching the gospel. We don't get away, we don't get to rely on, well, God can do whatever he wants with it. Okay, that is, it doesn't work that way. We plan, we think about it, we read about it, and we make, we make sure that the gospel is offensive, I agree. We make sure that it is the gospel doing the offending, not us. <laughs> okay, I think that's really, really critical. So, um, yeah, God can do what he, God can do all kinds of things with, with horribly done things. But, uh, but I, I would also argue that we have, we're given the brain to do it right, to do, to do the better, the best job possible. Okay, okay. sorry, we're, we're, sorry, we're, we're the last, last couple slides here. Uh, okay, wait, we, we already seen this. Oh, he's cool. okay. So God gave him the stew first. So he's talking about the Jews, and they did not. There's a, there's a so somehow within the Jews, there's chosen and the hardened, right? And then there's hardened ones who are in a stupor and they do not see. And then David comes along, and he and he doesn't get to call. And Paul quotes David, and he quotes out of Psalm 69. May their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and may they bend their backs continually. Okay. Uh, psalm 69 is a very interesting psalm because it's widely understood by, by early Christians um, to be messianic. Okay. So you look at Psalm 69, uh, in verse 4, you, you see this quote, More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause, mighty are those who would destroy me, for those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore, quoted in John 15. For zeal for thy house has consumed me, and the insults of those who insult thee have fallen on me. Romans 15, John 2. Insults have broken my heart, so that I am in despair. I look for pity, but there was none, for comforters, but I found none. Hebrews 12 and Matthew 26. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Matthew 27. And may there can't be a desolation, let no one dwell in their tents. Acts 1. So 69 is, is, is obviously a... Um, a understood messianically as a suffering of the, the, the Messiah, which is once again, um, it would not be understood this way by people outside of the Christian community. The Jews did not understand Messiah to suffer. Okay, I just to make sure that clear. The suffering servant that we think, oh, suffering servant, the Old Testament, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was never connected to Messiah. Okay, the Messiah is a triumphant figure, not a suffering figure. But once Jesus, what Jesus had gone through, the, the New Testament community, the people, says, wait a minute, we start reading the scripture, oh my gosh, it's all here. We have the suffering servant, we have Psalm 22, we have Psalm 69, that's really about this kingly figure who suffers. Okay. And so by signing 69, um, what we're, what's going on here, we have a, a clear sense uh, that Paul um, is focused on the Jews and their rejection of the Messiah, if we're going to recite 69 properly, right? 69 is about the Messiah's experience, and then there's a ground of their hardening, and which is this is going to get to issues that that freak people out, especially post Holocaust. Is there a sense in which may their table become a snare and a trap? Um, you know, may their eyes darken so they cannot see? Is it because of their rejection of the Messiah they're being hardened? Right? And if you want to think about the story this way, who actually saw Jesus? Who was exposed to the greatest revelation of God in history? Well, actually, put it backwards, just Israelite, is, the Israelites have been the audience of all, nearly all of God's greatest revelation. Right? You, 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 you do the Exodus thing, you do the, the Jericho thing, you, you go through all the great prophets, right, in, 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 the king, in, king's, in Samuel and King's period, and then you come to the New Testament and the Son of God and the Resurrection, God has revealed everything again and again to the Israelites. And so their rebellion against Jesus is really just expected. Okay? That's like, that's their pattern. So God's going to beg grace, pick a couple people out, but the rest of this group, they're in rebellion. And they're in a stupor, and, and they are so because, look, they're the <coughs> ones who missed the boat on the, on the Messiah. Okay. They've, been, they've been given the most knowledge and the most experience, and they can't see what's right in front of their eyes. So now they're going to be, it's going to be dividing the chosen and the hardened. Does that make sense? Ooh. 
So, questions? What are the remaining two sections? I'm sorry? What are the remaining two sections that we have to cover? Oh, uh, so yeah, in the, yeah, in the room, just Romans 11. We're going to get to the, uh, the, 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 the next time is going to be on the trees and branches, the relationship between Jews and Gentiles, and then the, the salvation of all Israel. That's 11, 11 to, you know what the verses are? Uh, hang on a sec. Let me, let me show it to you. Let me get out of this so I can t t tell you the division. So, you have a sense of what's going on so 11 to 24 and then 25 to 36. Not very long passages. 24. 11, 24, 25, 36. It's going to be very short passages. And we'll like zoom in. Because they're hard passages. These are already hard, sorry. These are almost incomprehensible when we just read them through. You, you, you just. You have to. Two more times and we make it through to Romans 9 to 11. Right. Good for everyone who's been uh, slogging through this. I think we're getting something out of it. <laughs> it's awfully dense. It's hard. This is hard. This is some of the hard, hardest part of the New Testament. It's yeah. It's 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 just not easy to to do. So you guys are doing a great job just kind of figuring this out. It's so. a, historically, it's had big ramifications for the church, right? It has. So the, there's lots of theology built off this, and 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 um, yeah. Can maybe close this in prayer. Sure. Let's pray. Um. Father, we uh, we're grateful that your that your text surpasses us in many ways, um, because it's not, it's it's still the process. We we never own it. We never feel like we master it, and so we, each time we read, there's new things and new thoughts, and and uh, you continue to teach us in this process. Um, we thank you that there are passages that are easy, much easier, and that they, they are also important. We thank you that these ones that are that, that require a lot of work. Because um, we want to be learners all through our lives and, and be, be disciples in your word. We thank you for this community here. Uh, thank you for your people. Help us to have soft hearts that are not hardened. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.